Good evening, good evening. It's such an absolute pleasure to have you all here tonight, spending your Thursday evening. Uh, tonight, I feel like, again, one of the luckiest people in the world because we're going to have an, a real substantive, authentic conversation with three tremendous musicians. And I want to thank the uh, Kennedy Center and their, this amazing REACH complex for allowing us to have a forum where we can really talk about, I think, what is cutting-edge material. And this is the intersection of science and the arts. And tonight, what we're going to do is have a completely unscripted conversation about how these three amazing musicians use their voice and hopefully some science about how they're able to do this as well. And so, you know, I'm somebody who my whole life, every time I hear music, I think to myself, wow, how do they do that? I always had that feeling. Every single time I hear something amazing, wow, how did that just happen? But I wasn't satisfied with just asking that question. I wanted to say, well, let me try to answer that question of how they did that. And so I started bringing musicians into things like brain scanners to try to understand how they did that. And so with these musicians, again, I think you'll see right away, it just takes a moment of time with them and you realize, wow, how do they do that? <laughs> and so what, they've been very gracious with their time and actually participated in some things that were actually uncomfortable and normally require anesthesia. Um, <laughs> and so I want to you know, give a, a big shout out to them for being able to participate in these experiments and sort of be willing to share their, their data with us, so to speak. And so if we think about music, for a moment, let's just sort of stretch back in time. The first musical instrument, we think, was a bone flute carved from the, carved from the bone of a bird that dates back to about 35,000 years ago. Okay? Just let that sink in for a moment. Think about your own life and how old you are, and then <laughs> think back in time 35,000 years ago, how many lifetimes you would have had to have gone to get to there. Music is old. Okay, we're not the only ones here in this room that have loved music. Okay? <laughs> So this has been around forever. Now, while this might have been the first musical instrument, it probably was not the first instrument. The first one was probably the voice. And so most of us, you know, at some point in our lives figure out that we have this voice, and it's actually very impressive watching an infant transition into child to do this. But using it musically is another thing entirely. And what we're going to really talk about tonight is vocal athleticism you know, feats of pure vocal athleticism combined with amazing artistry. And so in order to do that, I want to uh, introduce my uh, special guests for the evening. And so these are, I think, again, just tremendous individuals, and I've, I'm so glad I've spent some time with them. I'd like to introduce you to Chris Sullivan Shockwave. So Chris is a beatboxer, and he is actually about to uh, premiere in, on Broadway with Anthony Veneziale and Lin-Manuel Miranda with Freestyle Love Supreme. Please give us a, welcome, a warm hand to Chris Sullivan Jockey. So again, this is totally unscripted, so he doesn't actually know anything about what's happened. So I thought maybe you'd introduce yourself with a little beatbox. Hey, uh, is that it? <laughs> that works. Oh, there's the subs. takes a moment. <laughs> and there's some people that you meet and you realize, wow, music is just pouring out of this person. Please give it up for the great Esperanza Spalding.
If you've never heard Esperanza players sing, please do so, like, immediately, like, right now. <laughs> and so, um, the next person I'm going to introduce is, I think, has to be one of the world's most distinctive, beautiful voices I have ever had the good fortune to, to hear in a person. Please give us a warm welcome for Mr. Solomon Howard. Okay, good night. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's great to see you all here. So these three individuals did participate in functional brain scanning. And so before we do that, I want to get into a little bit of history. Right? I want to know what it is that has enabled you to do what you do today. And so to do that, we're going to just give us a little bit of context. Now, I think the question comes down to what is the voice? And so as a, as a surgeon and somebody who does science, I'm always impressed that even though the musical experience feels abstract, it feels some, like some profound philosophical thing that's happening, but it's actually rooted in biology. And so what I mean by that is your brain is not an idea. It's a physical reality that can actually be removed and held. Okay? It's a physical structure that we all have that enables us to hear music. That's true for our voices. That's true for our ears. So when we talk about the voice or the musical voice or music in the voice, we're really talking about neural output. Neural output that allows us to hear sound, neural output that controls laryngeal muscles, both voluntary and involuntary, and then neural muscles that allow us to put it all together and have a musical experience as a listener. So these are all things that, to me, they're um, fundamentally rooted in physical neurons that pr produce electricity. And so I like to think of us as very complex batteries trying to do all these things. Now, the voice itself, phonation, so this is, the, you know, obviously all of us have this voice box. You can go ahead and put your fingers on your throat. You'll feel it there. Okay, so this is your voice box. You'll feel it vibrating if you hum a little bit. Good, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So, <laughs> now, so what's happening there? The same organ that allows you to breathe allows you to phonate, okay? It's also what allows you to sing. And so your vocal cords are the things that protect your airway, protect, protect, prevent water and other things from going down that would kill you, and allow you to actually produce sound on the way out. So let's take a look at a little bit of demonstration. So this, these are the muscles of the, of the larynx. So, so again, these are real structures. When, when you are using your voices, or when these three artists are using their voices, they're controlling, whether they know it or not, the musculature of their larynx. Now, we can see this real time by putting somebody threw something like this, and so th this is... I don't recommend it. <laughs> now, Chris was very brave when we did this, because normally we use anesthesia. I think um, you can nose. actually see a tear. There's actually a tear. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tear, yes, that is in fact a tear. Um, and so what we're doing is actually looking at the voice box. Now, truth be told, I have a video of him beatboxing, but the editorial staff felt it was, quote, revolting <laughs> to show it live to the audience on a Thursday evening. So what I have is a much easier to understand, cleaner version of phonation. This is how a singer phonates, okay? Yeah, it's, it's a real thing. Yeah. So, so Esperanza just asked a really insightful question. She said, is that the real speed? So this is obtained by something called stroboscopy, which is a very brilliant idea, which when you sing at a certain frequency, that frequency can be measured. You can measure the frequency of vibration. If you put a strobe light in that strobes at that same frequency, you actually will slow it down and be able to look at the phases of movement and so you can just vary the strobe to the real frame rate and you can see different phases of motion. So what you're seeing here is strobo stroboscopic. In real life, the vocal cords are moving in an imperceptible, uh, imperceptibly quick rate. But this allows you to see it in real time, but pseudo slowed down for you, okay? So again, that, those are the muscles covered in mucosa that are allowing us to have these musical experiences. 
So with that in mind, I'd like to ask each of you to kind of share your story about how it is that you discovered your voices. And so let's start with Solomon. So first, I have to ask you, they haven't heard you speak yet, but I, I have. <laughs> how was your voice when you were born, when you were, when you were young? My voice when I was born, I was, a, I, was a, I was a boy soprano until like 10. And then my voice dropped. Uh, when I was 11, my voice started to change. And I became a baritone, bass baritone, and then eventually a bass. By 13, I had a voice similar to this. So I would get in trouble when I called. There was a girl in my class, I called her house, and like, her father is like, hanging the phone up on me. Like, Who's this grown man called? I'm like, I'm in the same class. I just need help with my homework. <laughs> but yeah, so, and I, I come from a very musical family on both sides. Um, so, you know, like singing in church, I'm a preacher's kid, uh, which explains why I'm so bad sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but I grew up in church and singing in the choir and, you know, kind of, you know, didn't have a choice, but had a choice, but didn't have a choice, so. <laughs> That's music for me. So let me get this straight. When you hit puberty, your voice went from soprano yeah. to where it is like, now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. Huh. And then when did you start singing opera? I started training to be an opera singer in 2008. I went to Morgan State University in Baltimore. Uh, yeah. HBCU grad. Um, and I, we, we toured the world singing with different orchestras, uh, symphonies worldwide. And before I left Morgan, uh, the I believe it was the spring of 2008, um, we worked with uh, Bobby McFerrin. And it was a concert, concert with Bobby where he, he would do improv on the first half and then he would conduct a uh, major symphonic work. And it was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Uh, and then earlier in the years, we worked with Wynton Marcellus as well. So for me, it was seeing two African-American males that were equally as gifted in jazz and classical music, and me coming from a background of gospel, some R&B, jazz. I also play Afro-Cuban Latin percussion, so coming from that, I didn't want to lose that. So working with those two uh, gave me the okay that it was okay to go and study classical music as well. I've you know, felt, fallen in love with it, working with all these different symphonies. And so it was 2008 that I started training to be an opera singer. And then I was discovered in uh, 2011, uh, after I finished my master's degree at Manhattan School of Music, I was discovered by, uh, by then uh, Maestro Placido Domingo when I came back home here to DC. And I did the Young Artist Program here at the Kennedy Center. I was born not far from here at Columbia Hospital for Women, and then my career pretty much being birthed here at the Kennedy Center, so D.C. is really my hometown, so that's how I got started. So, so when you were a child, or let's say when you were a teenager, did you have a sense back then that you would become a singer? Yeah, I knew it was either singing or using my hands to beat people up. I wanted to box for a little while. <laughs> um, natural I, pairing. Yeah, huh? and I uh, also played, I played football. I was a wide receiver, so, you know, it was something where I was going to be entertaining people. And I chose something that was a lot better for my body and my hands. Are, <laughs> so, okay. And then, Chris, how does one discover that they know how to beatbox? Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, kind of by accident. Uh, I grew up playing percussion. I was in a, 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 an amazing music program in Foxborough, Massachusetts. And uh, the music director was very inspiring and instilled within us percussion as uh, within the percussion department, a, a really disciplined sense of practice. And uh, I took that through my college life at UMass Amherst it, with improvisational comedy. So those two things kind of came together <laughs> in a giant mixing pot uh, where we would do improvisational skits on stage and I would be off to the side making those sound effects for, for said skits. 
and some of them would be something like we we came up with we came up with a game called Bust a Line, where there would be an improvisational scene happening, and at any moment the beat would creep in, and then they'd have to be forced into freestyle rapping. Uh, when I took that on, people kind of stopped and said, "Like you're actually good at this," and that's where the name Shockwave came in because I was nicknamed after a Decepticon from the Transformers. <laughs> that, for those who don't know, uh, Shockwave was known for busting out tunes. Uh, he was generally musically uh, incl inclined, so that nickname stuck with me to this day. Uh, and I've and when I moved to New York City, I got involved with Freestyle Love Supreme about 15 years ago. Uh, while In the Heights was being developed off, 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 off Broadway <laughs> in the basement of the drama bookshop in New York City, we were just kind of uh, playing around and still kind of doing the same thing. We're improvisation and hip hop and making up stories and scenes on the spot uh, helped me to get better at what I already was uh, already good at that I didn't really know I was good at it until it happened. So then when you were a teenager, had you ever beatboxed? We would make up songs in our, you know, for those of us who remember cassette tapes, anybody? <laughs> we, <laughs> we would make these songs on one cassette tape and then flip them to the next and record it from there and then do that. That's how we used to mix back then, like the um, reel-to-reel -reel player at home. So we would come up with our own drum beats for our own music and I... Uh, myself uh, as well as other friends of mine. So that's where we kind of just got into it. And that was before even knowing about that uh, beatboxing was a thing. And then fast forward maybe five or six years later, I'm, I'm meeting Dougie Fresh and like doing a gig with like Bismarck Key, you know? So like, oh, this already has been, uh, been going on. <laughs> <laughs> and that just gave me more fuel to the fire. You know? I see. Bismarck, is he Baltimore? Is he, was he, uh... I don't know where he is now. Yeah. It's just a friend. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> just a, sure, that's what they all say. <laughs> Esperanza, so you spent a lot of your younger life learning to play bass, and then somehow this voice emerges. Tell me about how those two emerged, whether it was in parallel or whether or not you were trying to develop that skill simultaneously. How, how did that occur to you that you actually can sing and play bass at the same time completely separate lines and improvised on both? Well, um, I didn't think singing was a thing that you had to study. I always just sang and made songs. I really <laughs> do know about cassettes because I would also do that and get all the layers back and forth. And then but it wasn't a very high tech scene. So you'd like play it at the speaker of one, have the recorder up to that and then make the layer and um, I did that a lot, just making songs. And I have a really distinct memory of my mother coming home from work. I didn't get to see her a lot because she worked so much. And we would walk the dogs and sing harmonies while we walked the dogs. That's like very distinct as a way that we would share time. I'd sing her themes I'd heard from TV shows and then she'd sing that and I would invent a harmony. <laughs> that was like a lot of our bonding. Um, so when the singing with the bass came up, it didn't seem like a a feat to be achieved. I just needed a way to remember the melodies to these standards I was learning by ear. Uh, I didn't know how to read the chord changes yet, so, and I learned that if I could sing the melody and learn the roots, it would imply all the harmony, and that's how I would learn the changes. So I guess just by doing that, which was very practical at that moment in my life, I learned that I could sing and play. And other people were like, what? How'd you do that? And, and I thought, well, the same way you would do it if you just sing and play, you know, it doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> so you had no formal voice training? Not then. I didn't get formal voice training until I had to learn this Wayne Shorter piece that was... Um, required some training to be able to do. Um, and I think it's time to get some more training. I'm in a room full of opera singers all week here, and I'm like... <laughs> 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 Y'all better sing with your voice. Uh, yeah, it's been a very um, <clears throat> organic journey. And so like then, that. you know, I think a lot of people when they listen to you or watch you perform, especially when you are singing and playing, start wondering about the independence or the codependence of those two things. 
So can you talk a little bit about that? So what is, are you, how consciously aware are you of the fact that you're controlling two separate processes? Yeah. Well, I do, I did practice that. Uh, I practice <laughs> being able to um, hear them both independently and practice interweaving them with each other in a context. So like one thing to just get the independence is I would study the Bach inventions, the two line inventions, and try to learn them by ear. I mean, I would learn them by ear to get in the habit of hearing what one line did while the other line was you know, in action. So instead of reading it and just memorizing it by rote, I would get it orally and then translate it. And then I would um, you know, take some chord changes to a song and maybe first just like arpeggiate it on the bass and sing like the third or something, you know, and just practice until I could think and hear enough. This probably sounds like nonsense right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's so, it's just, it's, it's such a specific skill that m most of you in this room will not <laughs> take away and work with, but that is um, how I did it. That's probably, actually why we want to know what you're Okay, well then. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go into some more. Basically, the same way that you would probably work on independence as a piano player. I just treat my voice like one hand and the bass like another. And really, don't think about it too much. Just decide what the task is to get to the you know, intended destination. Like, let's say, take a, like a very simple standard like all of you and just say like, okay, I wanna be able to sing the third of every chord and like arpeggiate each chord from the seventh or something. And just, you just keep doing that until you can hear it. And it, it's amazing how learning orally seems to translate across many dimensions that you haven't practiced. So just doing something like that will unlock your ability to move through the chords and the melodies in ways that you haven't explicitly shed yet, you know? Um, but I'm not doing that now. <laughs> I'm not practicing that stuff no more. But that's, that was my way into having some semblance of independence. And then what about, how does improvisation factor into that? So, I mean, I've heard you do this, so I, you can improvise both at the same time. So you can improvise vocally while improvising on bass all at the same time. Yeah, some days better than other days, <laughs> for sure. I mean, that was, that was something I was working toward these days. I wouldn't necessarily swing at that too hard. But um, yeah, I really, I think the, the closest parallel is, is piano. And again, it's something that's hard to describe if you haven't been through it as like an artist or um, a, a performer. You practice, let's say you practice the same 10 things for five weeks. You get access to like 25 things in addition to the, the 10 things that you practice. So, Practicing the study of improvisation unlocks your capacity to hear way more in real time than you actually you know, put your hands on with intention in the practice room. So a lot of that like, ability to improvise in real time just happened from stepping into environments of improvisation with what I had <laughs> and then hitting all the things I didn't have. You know? But you, you, you just you find a way. The more you bang your head against it, I shouldn't say that to you, but the more that you... <laughs> it's, it's almost like... Um, another part of your brain has been practicing. It's been putting together the things that you never thought to put together. And when you're improvising, there's not time to think about actually drawing those out and weaving them together. But you, you, you'll hear things that you never heard before, and if you, let, if you trust that you have the kinetic capacity to let it out, your hands will find that stuff. It's wild. I'll try that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see, you'll be, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. You know, you mentioned practice. I'm, a, I'm very fascinated by this idea of practice and training. So, you know, as a surgeon, even though you're formally trained, in the end, you teach yourself, right? You have, you, you, you're, you go, <laughs> I should clarify that, okay? You have teachers, you are being taught, but the way you actually get good is by teaching yourself because you have to analyze 
when the surgery's over and it's midnight, you have to figure out what you could have done to make yourself better. It's like playing an instrument and having a teacher who you teach, you have lessons with two hours a week, but most of what you're doing, you're doing by yourself. And so, um, you know, the great Pat Metheny told me that he still today doesn't think he can play what's in his head because he's not good enough. And so he feels like he needs to keep practicing to try to be able to execute what's in his head. And so, Solomon, can you talk about the practice that was involved when you actually made the decision to become formal in opera as opposed to singing um, what you would say would be more intuitively? Well, well f first, uh, back to your point about you teaching yourself, a lot of the great voice teachers, um, the great ones, will attest to the fact that you actually do, you are your, your greatest teacher because only you know what it feels like on the inside, vocally, um, if something is uncomfortable, they may, tr they may be trying to get you to sing a certain vowel on a certain note and it's, it's not working for you at that particular time and you have to go along with, I mean, a lot of what we do as vocalists, um, it, it evolves as our bodies change. So for my voice part, a bass, a bass tends to develop a lot later um, I, we'll, we'll reach our prime at maybe 40, 45 sometimes. So our voices develop a lot later or mature later than the sopranos, even uh, the mezzos, the lower female voices, uh, definitely later than tenors, but you know, eventually we sing longer because that's just how our voices are. It's something about basses, you know. We, you know. That's, 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 that's just what it is. But um, as far as uh, the training that I, I then had to start, you know, one, learning the languages, uh, but then uh, there's a way, be because I grew up, you know, in church and, you know, I developed what we call a falsetto with, in classical music, they may say your head voice, um, because I had that from church. Uh, there was a band that I sang with in church that I had to sing all the high stuff uh, because most of the guys had no- It was unfair. I mean, it was, it was un unfair, so, but most of the guys in, in, the, in the band, it was a gospel go-go band, if you know go-go music from DC, you know. Um, so it was a gospel go-go band and none of them had training and most of them weren't really singers. Um, they could carry a tune, but I had to sing all the high stuff, uh, so. I, I developed a, a good head voice for falsetto. Um, and then when I got to school, I tried to use that. It was a mix that I created, but then I had to relearn how to do that because in classical music, you know, they say that your sound should be one column of sound as opposed to all these different voices coming from the same body on the stage. Uh, so there are certain notes that I had to have. Like before I started school, I didn't have anything above a middle C in like the classical voice that I needed. I could create a sound, I could sing in my head voice, you know, whatever. Uh, but I needed to get that column of sound. So it was, you know, pretty much just, just hitting it every day, um, singing the notes. And then what, what we learned later is to always try and warm up to a half step or a whole step above where you have to sing so that where you have to sing is always there. You know, so you stretch yourself uh, to get above, and if that's consistent, you know, you don't, it, it could be okay. It will, that means then the note below that, the ones that you always need, should be great. You know, so we try and go above what, what we actually need. So, I mean, and also learning music, I'll learn it a lot. Sometimes I'll learn it faster. I'll swing it so I can actually get it, you know, because sometimes that translates more um, with some of the background, trying to swing it to, you know, with difficult rhythms. Um, and then also, because I play percussion, sometimes I'll just take something to, I'll go in front of the congas and, and play it and, you know, try and get the rhythms uh, in my body. But, um, it, I mean, it's, it was a matter of repetition, uh, learning language, learning notes. We, we break down our scores, we translate them. I mean, so much going on. So. Uh, you know, with instrumentalists, yeah. they often say that one of the signs of maturity is that you're no longer using your technique as an end in, an end in and of itself, that the technique is in service for the ultimate musical emotion. 
Can you talk a little bit about how that is true with you in opera or not true? Well, shoot. Uh, we always use technique. Yes. Um, I remember, uh, uh, so Ray Allen, one of the greatest three-point shooters or the, one of the purest shooters in the, the game of basketball, NBA, uh, Ray Allen often said that when he was physically tired late in the season, he relied on technique. So he just knew, I mean, his body, muscle memory, they, it, knew, it knew where where his elbow needed to be, where his shoulder needed to be, and then where to snap the wrist and, you know, release the ball, to release the ball. So that's something that, for us, um, I would say, yeah, technique is very important because there are days that, you know, unlike instrumentalists sometimes, uh, there are days where if we're sick, you know, our sound is gonna change, you know? And of course, as an instrumentalist, you know, you're not feeling well, then the energy behind what you play is gonna be different, so yes. But I, like the instrument will sound the same. As singers, we get sick, and, like for me, most people get a cold, their voice gets low. I get a cold and my voice wants to sit a little higher. It's like certain <laughs> notes that, I, that I, I'm used to having, Call me I when don't that have. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> And so I try not to get sick a lot, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all about technique, because those are the days, or, or we go into a theater and the acoustics aren't that great. Instead of pushing, some singers, inexperienced singers, would push to try and hear the, you know, because they want to hear themselves. And you'll see the seasoned singer, the veteran, they won't even stand up in, in a rehearsal. They, you know, we're, we're with the orchestra for the first time in a rehearsal. And, um, and I've seen it where the seasoned singer is, you know, not even standing, they're sitting, you know, may sit like this. And they're relying on, you know, what their muscles know to do as opposed to trying to push, create sound, putting their hand behind their ear. Like, so technique is very important for us. And it, and it actually, if you have a solid technique, eventually you don't have to think about it because you've built it. But uh, if you have a solid technique, then it carries you through, you know, for, for years to come. You know, and so Chris, a lot of musicians practice scales. How do you practice? <laughs> <laughs> me, 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 me. Uh, a lot of, uh, because of the nature of improvisation and um, how much performance happens, a lot of the, the things that uh, I, I actually practice happen in real time while performance is actually happening. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of technique, there are a lot of, uh, there are beatboxers who are uh, so much better than I am, that I would, that I would give credit to. Um, there's a lot of information out there about how to do this sound and this sound, and there are sounds that are named after certain people and uh, inhale, click roll, and the in, inward lip bass roll, and things like that. And it's a, it's like a that type of uh, that part of the art is like a, a, a new a new uh, rolling out of what beatboxing is now, as it becomes now a global phenomenon. If you go to YouTube and click any beatboxing tutorial, you'll be able to learn a couple things that you can impress your kids with. Um, so in terms of Studying technique, I dabble with that a little bit here and there to kind of learn from other people, but everybody's instrument is different. So a lot of the learning technique comes from, like Solomon was saying, uh, you know, the, the body, the self, and like what you were saying, like teaching yourself. So somebody m may learn that they have a, a deeper capacity for voice than, than tongue work, and some people may be the opposite of that. So... You know, some people may be, oh, I'm really good at that. So let me, let me now lean a little bit more on that or lean the other way. So for myself, I try to kind of find some place in the middle of finding what my body can do, um, how I can replicate the sounds of drums. So let the drums teach me, let my body teach me, and uh, repetition and practice. So uh, practice in real time so that the, the kind of third eye of listening and improvisation can kind of take on its own, its own motor, uh, incorporating that technique. Fascinating. 
So I talked a little bit about how all of these processes that we're um, discussing are actually rooted in biology. Let me just show you the biology of hearing momentarily. So sound is vibrations. It's vibrational energy that goes through the air, goes through our ear canals, hits our eardrums, sets three little bones into motion, and then sends a fluid wave inside the cochlea into motion. Inside the cochlea, an amazing thing happens. Vibrations become electricity. So another way of putting that is inside the cochlea, which is the snail-shaped thing over there, there's no more acoustics. Okay? There's no acoustics between the cochlea and your brain. You don't have sound waves vibrating in your brain. You have electricity. Okay? So all of the acoustics exist between the outer world and the beginning of that snail, or essentially within the snail. Now, what does, that, what does that mean? It means that in order for you to produce a sound, you also generally have to hear it, because it turns out that auditory feedback is one of the main ways you control your voice. And in fact, there are people that have certain conditions, such as stuttering, who can change, we can actually treat their stuttering by delaying their or altering their auditory feedback, because the brain is, is sort of tricked in a sense when it, when it hears something different than what it's expecting to hear. Now, so this is the, uh, the way we actually hear a sound. But that's not enough, right? So there's something, something else, and that something else is the brain. And so I think, one, for me, one of the most profound moments in medical school was when you're doing your first year dissections of the human body, and you get the privilege to dissect somebody's body. It's an amazing thing. And then when you get to the brain section, you have to remove it. And you're holding it in your hand. And you think, wow, I'm holding somebody's brain in my hand. Everything they ever thought or experienced, felt, every single moment of their life, contained in this thing I'm holding in my hand. That's when it's kind of impressed upon me that it's not just limited to that person, it's all of us. We all have these experiences that are artistic and moving to us. We love, we fear. It's all, it's all because of our brains. And so this is working as the kind of motherboard to interact, interface between our voice box and our ear. And so this is kind of the circuit that's taking place when you are singing, or hopefully when you are singing. Now, <laughs> So what happened was these three signed up for a functional MRI scan, which is basically a big MRI machine that, um, for those of you that have been in an MRI machine, you understand that it's a small tube. And so yes, it's very narrow, it's a big magnet, you can't just bring in a tuba in there and just start playing. <laughs> but what it's looking at is, is blood flow. So a normal MRI just takes a picture of your head, just like a beautiful picture. But this actually takes something called blood oxygen level dependent imaging. So we call this bold imaging. This means when a part of your brain is active, it's actually needs, it actually needs resources. And the way it gets those resources is that the blood gets shunted to that area. And then what's happening is that area of your brain is consuming more blood, and it's converting oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin, which happens to be detectable by a big magnet. Detectable by a big magnet. So you're, this magnet, if you go into a big magnet, it can sense, hey, this part of your brain is having increased amounts of deoxyhemoglobin must mean that the brain was active there. So it's an indirect inferential method, but it's pretty clever because in the end, you can generate these statistical maps of activity. So rather than seeing just the anatomical region on the left, you see a statistical cluster that says, this, brain, this part of the brain was very likely active at that moment. And this is how we do functional MRI scanning. So what we do is we take these three people <laughs> and we do this to them, okay? So they've never actually seen this. These are actually their brains, okay? <laughs> so you are seeing each of their brains in cross-section. We call this a mid-sagittal slice. You can probably tell that Esperanza's head is a little bit smaller than in the middle than, than certainly uh, Solomon's head there on the right, and then Chris's head is on the left. Now, these are, function these are anatomical images, and then what we do with these anatomical images is we overlay functional activity onto them. So let's see how we did that. We're trying to understand what happens in the brain of a musical master that enables them to produce this really world-class art. Today we had this amazing opportunity to work with Solomon Howard, who's an opera singer, but much more than that. He actually can sing gospel and also even jazz and improvise. When you're in this scanner, it's actually recording your blood flow usage in your brain. And so parts of your brain that are more active than others are using more blood and oxygen, and it's able to detect that. And so afterwards, it's gonna give us some sort of marker of where in your brain you needed resources in order to sing the way you were singing. This challenged me in ways that I was not necessarily used to. 
one being still in the machine that long. If you could keep your foot still, that'd be great. But once I got into what I do, using my voice, it was very relaxing. Sweet we have the beginnings of what I think may one day emerge into a comprehensive understanding of how creativity takes place. So before I show you your brain data, what did you think about that experience, Solomon? The hardest thing was being still. Um, for a, a little over an hour. Um, now, we're used to being very physical as performers, you know, and a lot of what we do, we translate that through, you know, movement, um, our, our body, you know, can tell you how we feel, uh, you, uh, you know, it's body language. And we, we do that as performers. Um, and to have to lie there, not move, and you had me, you instructed me to keep my eyes closed the entire time. Um, that, was, that was difficult. Uh, but like I said, once I started to, to sing, it became soothing, relaxing, and uh, kind of just got into a zone and was able to, have, like, before, before I knew it, like you were, they were rolling me out, you know? Just like, you know, well, I'm glad I'm still alive, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was exciting, actually. It was actually yeah. I'll admit, when, when you first walked in, I wasn't 100% sure you'd fit in there. Yeah, I mean, it was tight. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Shoulders drawn tight, but I. Yeah, I was but sli it was slightly worried, yeah. yeah. Slightly worried. So, um, if it's okay, I'm going to show you your brain. He's never seen this. Okay? Oh Actually, in fact, none of them have seen any of this. Okay, and so keep in mind, I've only had a few days to. We filmed these things recently. I've only had a few days to look at this data. Everything I'm about to tell you is preliminary, probably wrong, and <laughs> pre too premature to talk about. But we're going to talk about it. Okay. All right. So. Now, he did a lot of things in there. One of the things we had Solomon do, we tried to tailor each study to their individual uniqueness. And so one of the things that's so remarkable about Solomon is that he can sing different genres of music. So we actually had him sing in, um, opera and gospel, and we were actually trying to look at what changes when he switches genres. Now, you might think, naturally, that they're pretty similar activities. Singing is singing, right? And so it turns out that when Solomon is actually singing opera, he has more brain activity than when he's singing gospel. Okay? And so this is interesting. The area of the brain, you can see those red spots up that are towards the right side of the screen near the top of those slices. These are called axial slices of the brain. It's like slicing your brain into a loaf of bread like this. And what we're seeing is that your, your prefrontal cortex is more active when you're singing opera than when you're singing gospel. It's very interesting in light of what you just said about technique because the prefrontal cortex is sort of a master planner. Okay? It is actually how you, it's a, a very regulated executive area that's enabling you to coordinate all these complex things. In some ways, it's the opposite of what we have seen in some jazz things, including in yourself when doing jazz. So, for example, when you, so, so Solomon also improvises in jazz, and so we had him improvise on the C minor blues. This is your brain. I'm, I'm now I'm mapping both what's called an activation, which is a hot spot. You know, this part of your brain is active. But there's another thing, which is called a deactivation. That's kind of a weird concept, but it means the following. Your brain is doing something at rest. When you switch to a task, there are some parts of your brain that go down in activity from the baseline rest activity. In you, you have a lot of deactivations in that prefrontal cortex when you're singing jazz. This is the same area of your brain that when you're singing opera is way up. Okay, so I think it has, it, it's, it's an interesting idea because it has something to do with, I think, the amount of control required in order for you to, as you said, always have technique to, to do something in opera as opposed to something like jazz improvisation, which is more freeform, in a way more forgiving uh, to things like technical demands. And so to some extent, it's almost like a neurological reflection of not needing to control yourself as much. I don't, I'm not sure if you want to comment on that, but just, yeah, I just, yeah. No, I was just looking at the colors, blue. I mean, jazz, <laughs> jazz is just a lot cooler than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why it's blue. Good, I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
So this is also Solomon. If we, if we map you down three-dimensionally, this is what we're seeing here. So again, the prefrontal cortex of you is extremely deactivated, or I mean robust, huge deactivations. And this story is going to become clearer. But I actually believe that in high-level masters such as these, a lot of creativity is not about the brain turning on. It's about the brain turning off. Okay? It is about the brain getting out of its own way in very, very surprising areas. Okay? Now, so let's, let's just freeze that in our heads for a moment, and then let's go to Esperanza. My name is Esperanza Spalding, and here today I'm asked to be an improviser. I have been really curious about how music and healing interface. When I heard that the Kennedy Center was hosting an event called Music in the Brain, Charles Lim was presenting and I thought he might be a guide and an ally in the larger mission of investigating how music can serve in a therapeutic context. Well, Dr. Charles Lim had me up in this tube, this teeny little tiny tube, singing some samples of music that were memorized and then singing improvised melodies over a blues form. Okay, we're gonna get started. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, here we go. I'm really excited to see what commonalities emerge from the minds of all these different creators, you know, who identify as improvisers or who create in the space of improvisation. <laughs> so what did you think about being in the scanner? I knew you would fit, by the way. <laughs> it was so weird to create in such an unnatural environment. You know, I, I don't mean to diss on your C minor blues, but I was like, I don't feel inspired by this C minor blues. That's, that's fair. And yeah. you know, often in the spaces that we create, there's like active stimulation that like turns on that desire to generate something more than what you've generated before. So it was really uh, difficult for, to me it felt difficult to like be in this totally sterile environment with no other stimulation, just like, Okay, do something creative now. <laughs> like, what? Um, that, was, that was mysterious. And then how about as it went on? Because later on we had you do a composition oh, yeah. paradigm. So now that was much longer, so you actually had time to immerse. And we, could, uh, we don't have this today, but I'm going to analyze it because I believe that your brain attitude is going to change over the time of your composition. It's oh. about 10 minutes. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So did you feel at the end, that you remember you were working on that, you started working on a, a tune? Yeah, I did zone out, that's true. That's true, because that was like a different, that was um, the closest that I could find a parallel into what it's like outside of the scanner to be creating, which is like when you're in your home alone, zoning into a composition. Yeah. So actually, yeah, that part felt like, okay, I get this. I kind of forgot for a minute that y'all were in there and I was trying to figure out where to go next from that chord. It's yes, thank God, because, oh. <laughs> it was so weird to, to be making music in a place that long without the like, stimulation, the inspiration that I maybe am realizing from that experience I really depend on, you know? Yeah. Well, it's clearly not a concert hall. Um, <laughs> but I think that's one of the hard things about science is because we're trying to emulate what you do in a natural environment in a way that's totally unnatural. Um, on the other hand, maybe it's closer than not trying at all, right? So like, you know, did, because in the end, whether or not it felt 100% perfect, you were still able to improvise. Yeah. And so we couldn't fit her acoustic bass, upright bass in the scan. <laughs> so we did get, she was actually playing a piano keyboard that had a bass patch on it while she was singing. And so uh, I'm gonna show you some of your images. So this is actually very fascinating. Now, when you were doing the memorized standard, the one that we just heard you, your brain was active all over the place, okay? I mean, this, it's, this is like really, 
<laughs> I don't know, but it was actually very dramatic. I mean, your, your, your brain is firing everywhere when you are doing this. I mean, every sensory motor cortex is active, okay? And then when you actually switch to improvising, this is what happens. Okay? So again, what, what are we seeing here? We're seeing something called a relative deactivation because when you switch from the memorized portion to the improvisation, your brain is actually shutting off certain areas. Now keep in mind, you're hearing the same background track, you're singing, it's, you're doing jazz, but in one of them it was memorized and one of them it was improvised. And so if you actually do the subtraction, you can see it like this. Okay, so these are the subtractions. So this is what actually changed. So when you start improvising, I talked about this idea of the brain turning itself off. You having it robustly all over your brain. It's not quite as concentrated just in the front area like Solomon's was. And I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that you're often playing bass while you do this. Because we're seeing a lot of sensory motor deactivations, uh, even though you were singing. Okay? And so, now, if we switch that around, we also had her do My Favorite Things. And this is interesting because the first tune was something that she had never played before. It was a novel melody. This one we had her um, sing My Favorite Things and then uh, improvise uh, on my, my Favorite Things. She was singing, using the same words, but improvising the melody. And this is what we saw when you were doing that. You were, you were again, you were um, deactivated, but this, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a central blob in the second row right in the middle there. Those are part of your medial prefrontal cortex. Okay? It's this, this area right here in the center that's turning off. That's actually an autobiographical area in most people. And so it's interesting that when you were improvising, you were actually turning off that for a, for a song that is a standard. And I wonder, I wonder about that because it's, it's not your own words that you're singing, it's not your own melody. And so I just, it's very interesting in light of this idea that creativity is often a reflection of your own self story, sort of like an autobiographical thing. Now, this is a, how the three dimensional map looked for you during my favorite things. And again, what I'm showing here, there's very few relative activations when you're improvising. It's mostly a story of deactivation. So now in two out of three, what we're seeing here is that for you to do a creative improvisational task, your brain is turning off a lot of its own machinery, I think, to get out of its own way and allow these sort of subconscious automated things to flow through without restriction. Okay. Now. Microphone. Um, I'm just thinking about how for many artists, music feels like a refuge. It feels like a place that you can kind of rest and relax and soothe. And I'm just thinking for the first time seeing <laughs> how much of the brain was like, yeah, when you're doing a task that with intention, you know, that yeah. is by rote or is something that you are supposed to do and has a beginning, middle and an end. I'm just wondering if there are any implications for how playing improvised music or something improvisational it has like a soothing effect on the brain. You know, it cools you in some ways and how that might be why people who maybe have been in some sort of intense situations in life are often drawn to the improvisational arts, you know? That's a, that's a <laughs> pretty good insight there, Esperanza. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> She's like, no comment. <laughs> So, you know, you've often spoken about this idea of music as, as medicine. Okay, it's this idea that music is therapeutic. And, um, and I often reference your saying that because I think of this idea of you, you know, performing all around the world and seeing your audience changing as you're playing to them. Okay? Like they're having the experience of listening to you and the band play and somehow their life is better for it. Can you comment? Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think very much so. So, can you comment on what you think music as medicine means, or what what the idea of music doing good for the world actually means in a very concrete sense? I don't mean metaphorically or in a hand wavy fashion. I mean, what do you, what good do you actually think it's doing to the world? You're asking me specifically. I'm asking you specifically. Yeah. Okay. At this particular moment in time, today, I would say. It generates enough soothing, enough soothing and um, sensations of, of well-being in the body in real time in a place, because we experience music in real time. It's not a memory, it's not a book that you put down and you remember the chapters that happened before. It's so in the present. I feel like 
we get just enough soothing that we can feel connected to our fellow humans, recognize this commonality of experience, feel less alone, and feel just charged enough to keep going. At this particular moment, because it's an intense moment, and I often experience what I'm processing in my brain causing like pain and constriction and anxiety in the body. And it can feel isolating, you know, when you don't feel totally on when you're out in the world. And what I'm witnessing music doing today is like, give me enough peace and enough release and enough of a reminder that, oh yeah, like you, you know what I'm talking about. Like you can reach me, you can penetrate through that constriction or that suffering or that pain. Something that wasn't a, a thought or a theory or a promise of a deity out there like penetrated into the core of my being and like soothed me. And that, that gives me enough hope, you know, to keep trying <laughs> to solve this shit. Well, I mean, thanks for, thanks for saying that because I think we need to try to figure out, okay, so if scientists are gonna actually try to validate, it's, it drives me crazy that there's ever this idea that arts need validation, but I think in today's crazy times, a little bit of data might actually help the arts. Yep. And, yeah. and so maybe what we need to figure out is how do we actually measure that effect of, of music as medicine, right? How do you actually demonstrate that in a real person that their life improved because they went to that concert, because they had that experience of probably their brain changing while they were listening to you? I think one, one of the a, a way to, to be able to measure that you know, right away is that for whatever moment, like this audience right here, uh, hopefully they're not necessarily thinking about what's outside, what they, you know, what they have to go. So in a way, it's, it, it's an escape. You know? uh, so your mind is able to, to escape or forget about you know, what's on the outside, what's in the outside world at that particular time while you're seeing a performance. Actually, while we're giving a performance, because I mean, there there have been times where, you know, whatever I was going through when I went to, when I went to the stage, because I tried to be uh, sincere, and vulnerable, and you know, giving artists that I can't bring whatever drama, whatever troubles, problems from the outside, um, and then so sometimes you do use that as motivation. Some of the most beautiful songs were written by artists that were going through some of the most, you know, tumultuous uh, and, you know, dramatic, traumatic things in life. But um, being, you know, as, as far as opera is concerned, and, you know, I'm not necessarily composing music at that particular time uh, when I'm doing a classical piece. Um, I'm there as the artist to give of the give in that particular moment to give you know to convey whatever the composer's message was at, at, you know and at, that's what I'm to give and a lot of times I've you know I've had people say you know well there was something that that you did that that moved me there was something that a way you sang a note moved me at, and it was different and that's one of the challenges being uh, an opera singer is that you know we don't have the the liberty to improvise melodies we have to sing what's written and if you're doing a, a run of, of Aida or, or Wagner's ring cycle, whatever it is, you have to, it's, you're singing the same notes all the time. So you know, the challenge is, how do I emotionally uh, perform it differently, um, even though the staging is set, whatever. So how do I do that differently so that when the audience comes, you know, night after night, there are some people that come to every show, and it could be, 17 shows back to back of the same opera, and they're gonna be there every night. And uh, I mean, I appreciate those people, I love them. They're, they're crazy, but I love them. You know, I wouldn't see myself that many times in a row. Um, but you know, for, for a moment, they are literally escaping whatever their reality is, and in some cases, they're being better equipped to go back and to deal with their realities. So I think that's, uh, that's one of the ways that music is medicine. And it's not just medicine for the, for the audience, it's also medicine for us as well, as performers.
You, you really never change the notes? No, we can't. We can't. <laughs> How about when you're practicing? That's, that's when the conductor is like, ah, what the? When you you're know, practicing, man. do you ever change the melody around? At practicing? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, practicing, yes, but, you know, you try not to get to that habit because first day of rehearsal as classical, as opera, we are required first day of rehearsal to show up memorized already. Um, because we are showing up to actually start staging, not to learn. And, you know, different from theater, different from musical theater, different from film, you, you kind of memorize during the process. Like for us, everything has to be memorized. You know, and these are like, you know, 300 page scores and you know, language and so that we can work on the staging and put the, the acting together, not necessarily, you know, well, not the music. Actually, ne next time you come for the brain scan, let's look at that memorization thing. I li that's actually fascinating to me that you could memorize that much. Oh, wow. Yeah, next time, next time, yeah. <laughs> So, Chris also went in with the uh, FRI and the fiber optic noise canceling microphone. Let's see, let's see what he did in there. I am Chris Sullivan, and my stage name and my performance name is Shockwave, and I'm a beatboxer. I was asked by the Kennedy Center to participate in this experiment, and I gladly jumped at the opportunity. For me, being in the scanner was both so relaxing and so uncomfortable. There's l lots of little mini moments along the way of just learning the instrument of the fMRI machine to access a <coughs> When I'm doing that, there's vibrations that are happening that's moving my head, so finding new ways that I wouldn't do on stage, but uh, that I would do in a giant machine that sounds like lasers. Uh, and it was thrilling, it was really great. We, we, had, we had some fun. Trade fours. Improvisationally correct? Yes. Great job, we're coming to get you. I think improvisation is at the core of life, from life science to behavioral science to, to physics. Um, everything has some sort of element of creativity to it. So uh, it's really important for us to find that space between where they're all connected. So we actually had Chris do the beat to this jazz standard. And so it's a different thing because he's not doing the melody. And so this is what's happening when he's hearing the jazz standard. The activations are in red and the deactivations are in blue. Again, when he's improvising, even if he's doing the beat, prefrontal cortex up there is turning itself off. That's the blue-green stuff at the top. His uh, auditory cortex is very active when he's hearing these improvisations and his motor areas are more active. So, uh, something called supplementary motor area is more active when he's improvising than when he's doing a memorized beat. Okay, so again, we're starting to see how the brain is doing different, like different tweaks of, depending on the task, of shutting itself down, but also relying on other parts to get the job done. Now, you heard him do this trading force thing where he was just having a, a memorized exchange. Um, sorry, these are the activations and deactivations. Now, the trading force thing was very interesting because when we see him trading, so now this is again, you either have a memorized back and forth or an improvised back and forth. The improvised back and forth has intense shutdown of his prefrontal cortex, okay? Yet, he's using language areas of the brain. So these are classical language, these little red dots that are lighting up. Some of them are sitting in class language areas of the brain. He's using his language portion of the brain to have a beatbox conversation, okay? <laughs> And this is a spontaneous conversation, not a pre-learned one. It's, it's when he's doing the interactive exchange using beatbox. No, no, no words. He's using his Broca's area. Okay? He's, using air, he's using auditory areas that are normally what we call classical language areas. So this, I think, again, gets this idea of maybe how it is possible that something like music could be 
a universal language because it employs these same areas that language does without the need or use of vocabulary. Okay? So, um, Chris, you want to give us some of your thoughts on what, what this experience was like for you? I mean, that's, that's really interesting, the language part. I mean, literally listening, uh, turning over what am I going to do next, uh, listening for pattern, listening for dynamics, volume, uh, swing, and then personalization from what the other person is giving you, digesting all of that and deciding what you're going to do with it and then giving it back. And then while doing it, you're thinking while you're doing it, how do I begin the phrase? How do I escalate it? How do I end it? What callbacks do I bring? And everything I just said seems like what happens in regular conversation when you're just using words as well. So that makes sense that it would work with language. Yeah, that's crazy. It does really make you wonder which came first. Now, I think evolutionarily, a lot of people think language came first and then music was the outgrowth. But it actually, it is plausible that it was the reverse, that language was a specialization of brain structures that existed to be able to handle something like music, which is far more complex in terms of acoustical features than language. Far more complex. In fact, when I do cochlear implant surgery, restoring language perception is not that difficult. Restoring music perception is almost impossible. Wow. Okay? It is that much more demanding and harder for the brain to process. And so it sort of makes sense that maybe the, hard, the machinery needed for music was the, was the requirement, and then language was a subset. So, you know, and we, in the last minute, what I really just want to do is thank the three of you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Chris Sullivan, Shockwave. Solomon Howard. Esperanza Spalding. Charles Lim. Dr. Charles Lim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And thank you all for coming this evening. Thanks to the Kennedy Center for having us. Have a good evening.